One of the problems, I suppose, of being a scientist is that you feel obliged and you obviously have a great responsibility to share information with the wider public. But oftentimes you really don't know how to do it. You know, are you doing it, are you doing enough? Are you doing it right? Is the level right? And of course, you know, are you meeting expectations? Uh, and I hope those people who come to Angava at least get something directly or indirectly from what we're trying to do. Uh, we feel it's important. Uh, and I hope that it works out in some sort of way. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Ongava Research Center uh, here at Ongava Game Reserve in uh, northern Namibia. Uh, my name is John Mendelson. I'm the director of Ongava Research Center, and it's a pleasure to be able to talk a little bit about it. Uh, we, in addition to the research center, you're here in the visitor center at Ongava, uh, which is a uh, facility developed jointly between ourselves and Ongava Game Reserve. The uh, research center is a newly expanded and developed institution. Uh, originally, it started off in about 2004 as a modest uh, part-time uh, activity involving a couple of people, which uh, did some and they did some very interesting work. But very recently, we've benefited from a very generous donation from a shareholder, Mark Walter, a shareholder of Angava, who made available some money to develop a whole new research center and indeed this visitor center as well. What's special about the Angava Research Center, which is really makes it quite different from most research centers around the world, is that it's privately funded. This comes on the back, if you like, of a more developing, developing involvement uh, of the private sector in conservation and tourism. Uh, probably 50 years ago, very few private enterprises were involved in tourism or uh, at least in conservation, very much so. It was conservation was always a, a government enterprise, the same with education, the same with research. It's always, these are things that have been the purview of, of government, but more and more the private sector has taken a role, an important role, or playing an important role uh, in these things. So we're really lucky and we're very, uh, to have this privately run and privately funded uh, research center. Of course, we've come a cropper, and now with COVID-19, because our funding comes from tourism revenue, and no tourism means no revenue for us. So for the time being, we're tightening our belts and living off a bit of savings. Uh, so that's a disadvantage, if you like, but there are many advantages of, being, uh, of having this kind of private initiative and private uh, support. Uh, that's really the key, the key element. So we spent a lot of time trying to figure out some of the things that are focusing, if you like, not so much on what is known about conservation or about wildlife or about the environment, but focusing more on what is not known. It's some of the really big questions which we think uh, require answering, just to give you an example. In this part of the world, we have a lot of, quite a number of different species that are rare. Uh, rare in the sense that they are few individuals on the ground, civil cats, civets, honey badgers, cheetahs, black-footed cats, there are a whole lot of them. And, you know, you, if you were to have to, if you were able to map out where all of them lived across this landscape, you'd probably find one animal every 10, 15, 20 kilometers. Many of them have probably been rare all along or thinly, you know, thinly uh, distributed or uh, small in number. But that raises a really interesting question. How do they communicate? So if, imagine you're a, a female black-footed cat coming on heat. And how do you find a male who might only be, you know, 10, 15, 20 kilometers? Or what can you do to advertise the fact that you're on heat? A very simple question, but that kind of question is really interesting. We don't have any answers at all. Nobody has any answers. Uh, we know that elephants, for example, can communicate over long distances using infrasound. But when it comes to a whole lot of other animals, we have no clue at all. You may say, well, that's kind of academic question, which, of course, it is. Other components, if you like, or other interests. And, you know, it just may turn out that we as humans are doing things that might interfere with whatever communication system these animals are using. And at least we should know that we're not getting in the way. But at the moment, we have no clue what's going on and we have no you know, idea of what we're doing. Uh, another area that we're really interested in is, is the single biggest environmental problem in pretty well the whole of Africa is deforestation or degradation from slash and burn agriculture. Of course, one cannot take away the, uh, the opportunity, the right, if you like, of people to clear, clear land and plant food that happens all over the world. But the problem in Africa, and that is why Africa has such a low population, is that the soils are generally poor. 
So in an area where soils are poor, you have to clear more frequently. And what is particularly bedeviling is that the yields are, are really, really low. Uh, the farming systems have developed, evolved, if you like, to be low input, low output systems because you live in such a depauperate environment. But you end up with a kind of double disadvantage in that you lose all this woodland. And I mean, you know, vast areas of Africa have been stripped of natural woodland, but people remain poor. So uh, you have this double problem of losing environmental resources because the soils are poor, the forests or the woodlands don't regenerate quickly, and people remain destitute. Uh, they may have something to eat, but they have no income, they have no money. My research could inform more on the environmental side, Namibia being known as the driest country in the sub-Saharan Africa. And doing research in such environments could aspire more people to come and have a look and see what is going on on the ground. Apart from tourists just seeing in newspapers and magazines that Namibia is this beautiful country and it's dry, it will also be exciting that would encourage them to come on the ground and see what is happening on the ground. The role I want to play in northern Namibia, firstly being born there, having grown up there and have seen how things have been happening and how things have been changing over time. It would be really interesting to see how I can use my research to become and informative tools, not only to scientists in Namibia, but to governments, policy makers, and donors, for them to really focus on the important aspects of towards a sustainable rural livelihoods in Namibia. With conservation, we are able to answer some of the questions of things we do not currently understand, and it gives us a brighter idea on how to be able to well conserve our natural resources, and in the end, it all boils down to our natural resources, which are the ones that are a motivational factor for tourism in Namibia. So we've set ourselves an ostentatious, ambitious, high goal of trying to establish long-term research programs here, uh, programs that can go on for five, ten years, go long beyond my lifetime but the kinds of programs that can answer some of the big questions, some of the fundamental uh, challenges that conservationists and biologists and scientists around the world face, uh, that's the kind of thing that we think is worth doing. And at the same time, we want to try to find young Namibians who have passion, people who, have, who are curious, uh, people who are inquisitive, and people who are likely to make biology or research or conservation their, their career. So if we can get in foreign scientists and foreign students and pair them up with, uh, with young Namibians who have that kind of potential, who are really going to go forward you know, for the rest of their lives doing this kind of work, uh, doing conservation that's valuable to, to Namibia and, of course, to the rest of the world. Ultimately, you can ask the question, well, what is science really doing for conservation? We can do an awful lot of esoteric academic research, but, I mean, how much does that really... How does that have an impact on conservation and how does it have an impact, if you like, on tourism? And there's one good example behind me here uh, where we have a panel in the visitor center about animals being individuals. Perspectives have changed very much. Uh, when I was a youngster at university, the thinking was that animals are all much the same. Individuals are as of the same species, of course not different species or uh, species differ. But within any one species, they're all pretty well the same. They don't think, they don't have a conscience, they don't plan, they don't use tools. Of course, science in all sorts of forms have dispelled a lot of those myths. And one of the most important things for conservationists to realize, and for tourists as well, is to appreciate that all those that wild animals that you see out there, you know, you might see a thousand springbok or a hundred zebra or a pride of lions, all of those animals are as much individuals as your pet dog or your pet cat. They may not have a name and they may not cuddle up to you, but they're individuals and they are each with its own set of genes, each with its own personality, and each with, if you like, a contribution to play uh, to the genetic makeup uh, of, those, uh, of those populations. So a lot of the research that has discovered, you know, the individuality of, of animals has, as, as I said, been of an academic nature, esoteric nature. 
uh, people might say, well, why on earth do you want to do it? But the benefits uh, and the implications for conservation have been immense in really moving our perspectives uh, on animals away from being rather dismissive, kind of group-centered, you know, everybody, everything sits in a group. Uh, and now we start to appreciate there's an awful lot of individuality and a lot of value uh, in animals being individuals. That's really important for conservation, really important for tourism. Tourism, and I think if tourists coming here start to look at some of the animals that they see, not as just a springbok or a rhino or as an elephant, uh, but look at them for their individual values, look at the little uh, patterns that they might have, distinctive patterns, of course, on their, that doesn't say anything about their personality, but it's a signal, it's a sign that these animals are, are individuals and each in their own right are worth looking after. Mm -hmm.